So welcome tonight. We are sort of, this is the third program in our more than a month um, SFPL's version of Black History Month, which is, you know, American History Month. We are doing all the way through January and February. So stick around. We have a lot more events, but this is a really exciting one. We are so excited to have this panel tonight featuring authors S.A. Cosby, Kelly Garrett, Gar Anthony Haywood, and Cheryl A. Head. And they're gonna be discussing the history of black writers and crime fiction and the future of black writers in the genre. Um, tonight, we want to acknowledge the uh, many Ramutush Ohlone tribal groups as the rightful stewards on the lands of which we reside and work here in the Bay Area. And we are committed to hosting programs, providing information, and book lists. It's what we do. Um, so those are also in that document. Check out our YouTube. This video will be on YouTube after the event, but we have a lot of We've partnered with a lot of great indigenous um, groups and we have lots of great videos and a lot of the programs all year round. We also want to um, acknowledge the painful and violent situation our country remains in and acknowledge uh, that we're all even here tonight in this, you know, these times. It's just, I Thank you all for being here, for sure. Absolutely, let's take our minds off things for a nice hour and forget about that. But do know that San Francisco Public Library stands in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and um, against police brutality and violence and killing. And we are working in our own institution to end our systemic racism and institutional racism, not just in the library, but in our community as a whole. And you can check out our, um, go on, if you just Googled SFPL racial equity, you will find our updated racial equity um, work that we're doing. Also lots of links in that document that I sent. And, and here we go with a quick slideshow, super quick. And we're gonna get on with tonight. We are celebrating the 16th one city, one book. This is where everyone in the city reads the same book. And we are going to be celebrating Chanel Miller for her book, Know My Name, a very powerful book about her sexual assault on the Stanford campus and her um, dealings with the court system. She's an amazing author and an amazing artist. So that's happening in March. We have a bi-monthly read at the library, again, uh, where we try to get all of our community to read the same book. So January and February selection is Old Drift by Namwali Serpel. Very good, very, um, it's also got a little thread of science fiction. So check it out. Um, tonight, we'd like you to support and buy your books local. Pick up all of our fine authors books tonight from Borderland Books, who were voted the best mystery and sci-fi books. Or you can support Marcus Books, nation's oldest black owned independent bookstore. That was really quick. So we love bookstores, hashtag we love bookstores. Shop local, support these people. Do not let our bookstores go out of business. Your library will be here. We won't be a city without our bookstores. So please spend your money there. Lots of things coming up. Saturday evening at 6 p.m. We don't do too many of these evening events. So come out and celebrate. And show why we should. Um, we're gonna be celebrating the life of Miguel Algarin, um, poet, and it's gonna be fun. Like I said, this is a celebration of more than a month, Black History and Heritage. So take a look at our website. I put a link in that document for all of the events for more than a month coming up, and we have a lot. Um, the 26th, Diane Ferlotti and Eric Pearson will be telling us uh, stories and it's gonna be great because she's gonna do a version for adults. So come check it out. And I am now going to turn it over to Cheryl Head, who is going to moderate tonight's panel. Cheryl was originally from Detroit, now lives on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, where she has navigated a successful career as writer, television producer, filmmaker, broadcast executive, and media funder. Her self-published debut novel, novel Long Way Home, a World War II novel, was a 2015 Next Generation Indie Book Award finalist in both African-American literature.
and historical fiction categories. Her award-winning Charlie Mack Motown mystery series is set in Detroit, featuring a black lesbian private investigator. When not writing, Head consults on a wide range of diversity issues. And Cheryl did one of our new social media hooked on a book, so did Kelly. So check those both out and we'll put those in the link. And I let's give a big round of virtual applause for our panel tonight. Thank you, everybody. Cheryl. Thank you, Anissa. Thanks so much for the San Francisco Public Library for having us do, do this panel. I'm really psyched about being with these luminaries. Uh, Gar doesn't want me to call him a luminary. But I'm <laughs> Um, let me introduce them real quickly. You've seen their long bios, you know they're award-winning and celebrated authors. Well, let me tell you a little bit about them. So Gar Anthony Haywood is a three-time Seamus Award winner, an Anthony Award-winning author. He's written 12 crime novels and numerous short stories in the crime genre. His work includes the Aaron Gunner Private Eye series and Joe and Dottie Loudermilk mysteries. And his new novel, which I've read, is really interesting, a departure for him, and I hope he'll talk about it before we make our exit tonight. Sean S.A. Cosby is an Anthony Award winner. Uh, last year, he had a blockbuster of a novel that was prominently placed on most of the best of 2020 mystery and crime lists. And in case you've uh, only been watching HGTV for the last six months, it's called Blacktop Wasteland. Sean is a writer with Southern Roots and he's already in the proverbial catbird seat with his new book, Razor Blade Tears, which comes out in July and has already been picked up for film adaptation. Author Kelly Garrett is a true influencer in the mystery crime community. Her novel, yes, you are, Hollywood Homicide. <laughs> like, I, didn't, I didn't write that in the bio. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood Homicide is about a semi-famous mega broke black actress that won the Anthony Award, the Agatha Award, the Lefty Award, and the Independent oh, Publishing Book copies. Award, <laughs> the best first novel. Her second <laughs> book in the Detective by Day series, Hollywood Ending, was featured on the Today Show's Best Summer Reads, the 2019, and was nominated for both Anthony and Lefty Awards. And Kelly serves on the National Board of Sisters in Crime and is a co-founder of Crime Writers of Color. And we'll talk a little bit, a bit more about Crime Writers of Color before we, we end today. So I'm gonna jump right in it. This is like a Black History Month thing. So I, what I like about it is it's starting <laughs> in January and we're gonna try to extend it through March because we only need more than 28 or 29 days. So <laughs> since this panel is called Black Crime Writers, Celebrating the Past and Looking Forward to the Future, I'd like to ask each of you to spend uh, a minute or two on a Black author of the past that you admire and tell our viewers um, what's special about that author and their, their writing, what's unique and valuable about, about them. Let's start with you, Kelly. Sure. Um, my pick uh, was Valerie Wilson Wesley. Um, she uh, was part of the wave that was around with Gar and Walter, Barbara Neely in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, her first book was a Black Woman PI series. It came out in 1994 um, when Death Comes Stealing. And it was it takes, takes place in New Jersey. And so that was around the time I was a teenager and I lived in New Jersey. And so just to see a black woman in a mystery, because I love mysteries, I love them so much. And then also to recognize the places like, oh, I recognize 280 and I recognize the towns. It was such an influence on me. And I think um, Valerie's a big influence on a lot of authors, especially black women. Uh, crime writers. I know Tracy Clark says the same thing. And so um, she took some time off. You know, I think part of it might be just publishing isn't always kind to Black authors when it comes to um, keeping them published and was doing paranormal and romance. But she's coming back out with the new series uh, that comes out, I think this month, maybe next week, it's a cozy paranormal series. I think the first one is called Glimmer of Death. So she's been such a big influence. So she was an easy choice for me. Excellent. Wow, what a great choice. She has one of the best first lines in any mystery novel I've ever read. I'm on a paraphrase because I don't have it in front of me, but it's something like, all I wanted to do was go and buy a fish sandwich. Oh, yes, I remember <laughs> that one. I wonder if it's this one. I should look. <laughs> Let's turn to you uh, next on this question, Gar. Who is your pick for Black author that you really want this audience to know about and admire? Uh, what's valuable about, about their work and their books? I'll, I'll give you my answer in a minute, but um, one okay. thing I wanted to ask Kelly, because I think this is kind of a vital question is, 
Kelly, how did you discover Valerie? Like, how did she come to your attention when you first found her book? My mother. My mother is a huge uh, reader. And so she was reading so many people like Sue Grafton and Sarah Paretsky and Walter. And so, and she would just give me free reign on her book, her bookshelf. So in any book I wanted to read, even, even if it was Jackie Collins, I could read it. And so that's how I, I found Valerie, you know, and then I would go to the bookstore. She dropped me at the bookstore at the, the Barnes and Noble by my house. And I would just like peruse the shelves and be able to buy one. So that's how I found her. That's great. Good, good question, Gar. Yeah, so I tell me about your pick and then tell me how you found your pick. Sure, sure. Uh, Chester Himes was my first introduction to, uh, to African-American crime fiction uh, of the day, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a black, I'm a, I'm a child of the black exploitation uh, film era. And so a lot of the books and authors that I ended up reading uh, voraciously, I initially found through a film, one film mm -hmm. or another. So in the case of Chester Himes, uh, the movie Cotton Comes to Harlem, uh, that was starred uh, Godfrey Cambridge and Raymond St. Jacques. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I saw that movie and I was just completely blown away by it. And anytime I find out that a uh, film is based upon a book and I really like the film, then I, you know, I, I, I find that book, I dig it up. And so that's what I did in this case. And that's how I discovered Chester Himes. And I read a few of his books after that. And I was really amazed uh, by his story in, because of the era that he, essentially he was writing in and what he was getting away with, frankly. You know, he was using a, a, some racy language, some racy situations, and he was uh, very tongue in cheek. Anybody that's read his work knows that there's a lot of humor in what he writes. Mm -hmm. Making as much fun about of black people as he is of white folks. So he's <laughs> an equal opportunity satirist, so to speak. Um, and I really love that about his work. It's, it's, it's timeless in that sense. Excellent. I, I like Chester Himes too. Who doesn't remember maybe Kelly, she's too young, seeing that movie in the theater. That's right, I am. <laughs> I am. I'm too young. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Sean next uh, and, and then, I'll, then I'll name my pick. I, I'm going to give you my pick, but I'll tell you real quick, Cotton, Cotton, Cotton Comes to Harlem has a legendary uh, place in my personal history because Cotton Comes to Harlem in its original run was my mom and dad's first date. That was wow. the first date they we went to see that movie. Wow. Wow. So, and so that's how they, they, they were their first date. So, and so that like always has become a, it's become a part of our personal, our personal mythology. My mom didn't like it either, so. That's pretty funny. I know writing crime writing. She does not like crime writing. But um, Joe, tell me, there's too many curse words in your book. <laughs> but um, my personal choice was uh, Donald Goins. Uh, that was my first introduction to a black crime writer. I had read a lot of different uh, mystery novels. I've, I've been a voracious reader since I was seven or eight years old. And uh, my mom read uh, biographies and my grandma read romance novels. And my uncle on my dad's side read mystery novels. And so one day, uh, my mom and dad <laughs> separated, got back together, separated many times. And during one of their separations, uh, my dad and my uncle were babysitting me. They had me riding around with them as they did some errands. And we ended up back in my uncle's house. And I saw the book on the table. It was a book called Fiend by Donald Goins. And I asked him, I said, what is this? He's like, oh, you're too young to read that. <laughs> and my dad said, well, let him have it. It'll keep him quiet while we Fix, they were fixing something at my at my grandma's house, and so I read it that day, and then I found I searched out everything I could. My library didn't have Donald Goins books, so I had to go to like thrift stores and yard sales to pick up, you know, Kenyatta's Revenge and and all his other books. And the thing that struck me about Donald Goins was his just unrelenting honesty. His books are brutal and raw, and they're sort of a, a, a precursor to exploitation films. But there's just a certain level of no BS with him that really struck a chord with me, that really influenced me later as a writer. It made me always want to tell the truth in my books. So That's excellent. And I should have told you that you know, I'm a moderator, but Kelly has insisted I also be a slash panelist. So I'm going to jump in every once in a while. So on this question, I want to say that my pick is a person called Nikki Baker. That's her pen name, Jennifer Dowdell who was the first person to write an African-American protagonist in a lesbian, lesbian mystery series. And this was back in the 90s. Her first book was out in 1991. 
And I was reading, you know, lesbian mysteries. I wasn't out. So I, you know, I'd be reading these books that got delivered to the house in brown paper packages and stuff. So people wouldn't know what they are. And, you know, and I finally was able to go into a bookstore and find a book written by an African-American lesbian that had a black woman on the cover. I saw the cover, this is 1991. I went, that's a black woman on the cover. And it was a mystery. It was queer and it was African-American. So for me, it was like a literary trifecta for uh, a young black woman in Detroit to, to see herself in the pages of this book and to imagine that was me on the cover of the book. Um, her books uh, have been out of print for about 30 years. Uh, she wrote three books and then kind of dropped out of sight. Uh, but a, a company called Requeered Tales is reissuing her books. Um, started last year, reissuing, reissuing the three books she wrote. And they asked me uh, to write the foreword for the third book, Long Goodbyes, which I was honored to do. And it'll be out in March. So Amazing. That's so let's, awesome. anybody, Cheryl, let me interrupt. Anybody yeah. that, that, that writes a forward to a book is a luminary. Just, just <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think you're trying to say Illuminati, but I really do think. <laughs> <laughs> you got that email so, too? <laughs> yeah, that helps. So I'm gonna, let's, uh, flip, let's flip the switch on the, on the question. This is January, the named after the Roman god Janus, who looks forward and who looks back. So let's, let's look at the current and forward situation. Who are uh, one or two or three current Black crime fiction writers that you want to give a shout out to that should be on the 2B red pile of anybody watching this Zoom meeting? Uh, so let's start with you, Gar. Oh, my turn first. Okay. Um, Attica Locke. I mean, anybody that's not reading Attica Locke is missing out on essentially, you know, I, I hope she doesn't uh, find this objectionable, but to me, she's the female Walter Mosley. I mean, mm. she's just a, a brilliant writer. Yeah. Uh, her use of language and she, her situations yeah. and locations are very evocative. Uh, she just is just a really, really smart, smart writer. I love everything that she does. Yeah. Um, and then I like, you know, my boy Gary Phillips. I like yeah. to read this stuff because he, he, he buries himself in research. You know, a lot of his stuff is historical and nobody writes a, a historical crime fiction novel based upon black people and the black situation is better than, than G. I, I think Gary Phillips is another one. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Sean, let's go to you. Um, a couple of ones that, that stand out to me. Uh, one is someone who hasn't been published yet, but it's a great new writer named Yasmeen McClinton. She won the Bland Award, and I was very honored and privileged to read her uh, uh, a novel that she's working on that should be, uh, hopefully will be out soon. She has um, got just an incredible mastery of language. Um, she writes about the African-American and the African uh, experience. Uh, was something I haven't seen before in, 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 a, in, a, in a really good crime novel. Uh, and so I just can't wait for more people to, uh, to get a hold of her work because I think she's going to be, she's going to be a superstar. Right? She's going to head into the stratosphere. Her writing is, is amazing. Um, another person that really stands out to me uh, as a part of our, our, our current uh, crop of folks, um, and I'm stealing your answer a little bit, um, uh, uh, Cheryl, is a, uh, um, John Vercher and, uh, and Chris Chambers are two guys that are writing very interesting crime novels, uh, contemporary crime novels um, that are deconstructing certain ideas about blackness and class in a way that I think is pretty unique. So those are two folks that I hope somebody, folks will, uh, will reach out and search out. That's excellent. John, no, I don't mind you stealing the answer. <laughs> Kelly Geary. So my, um, I had so many talented people coming out right now. I feel like we're in a little renaissance. Um, but my choice is Rachel Hazel Hall. And I'm not saying that because she's here. Um, but Rachel, I feel like her first, <laughs> she's been published for the past two decades consistently. Consistently, she, um, her Lou Norton series came out in 2014, which is about a black woman police officer in LA, which is where she's from. And she just really captures um, Los Angeles great. And I know that Gar thinks that Attica Locke is um, the female Walter Mosley. I think Rachel is. 
Um, and I will fight, I will fight you, Gar. But I'm not saying Attica's not talented, but I just think Rachel, <laughs> especially with Los Angeles, um, you know, she has a Los Angeles connection and she's just able to write such a wide variety of things because she has the police procedural series. She has this one, which is Domestic Suspense. Um, her new one that was out last year, which is getting all the buzz, was just nominated yeah. for a lefty along with Sean. Um, and now she's gone and I would have that up, but Mike gave it to my aunt to read, you know, and she has a new another series coming out with uh, Thomas and Mercer this year. She's just so talented, can write anything. And I kind of hate her because she writes so well. Yeah, um, so I, it's like, I don't like, I'm like, ugh. But, so then she's like really nice too. So it's kind of hard, but I still hate her. Um, and so I just think, I think she's amazing. And so I think you, it, like, you should definitely add her to your um, TBR list. So all her books, Great which are a lot of them. Great so. so I'm not going to follow the rules. I'm just going to name a bunch of people real quick. <laughs> oh, wait, I, name them. I forgot. To, I have other people too, but name some. <laughs> I, I want to mention the other person who's nominated for a Lefty Award along with Sean and Rachel, and that's Tracy Clark. Tracy's my girl, and Cass Rains is my girl, too. Her, yeah, her phenomenal main character, who I think is comparable to Sue Grafton's Kenzie Milhone, and I've told Tracy this many times, so she won't be surprised at that. Um, I also want to shout out to Delia Pitts, uh, her Shelby, Shelby J. Rook. Um, protagonist I love, um, Abby Vandiver, who writes the Romaine Wilder Mysteries, Frankie Bailey, who we stand on her shoulders, a lot of us, Lizzie Stewart Mysteries. You want to shout out some more people? Yes, um, as someone who writes traditional lightweight amateur uh, detective novels, I should shout out my fellow cozies, uh, yes. Valerie Burns, VM Burns, uh, has three series. Alexia Gordon has a paranormal series. Um, Abby also has, a, under Abby Collette, has another series as well that she's doing with Berkeley. Um, and so also Patricia Sargent, Olivia, Olivia Matthews, she also has two cozy series. So um, mm -hmm. it's been a lot, it took a long time for a lot of, for black women to get into knock, to basically break into cozies. Mm -hmm. But now that we're here, we are represented, yeah. so. Yeah, that's so If I could jump in here just one quick second. Sure, because yeah. Sean, Sean mentioned the Bland Award. And you know, that's named after Eleanor Taylor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and this conversation yes. would not yeah. be uh, complete if we did not pay tribute to Eleanor. Uh, I knew Absolutely. her very, very well. She died way, way too young. Absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, Kelly, I hope you take this in the way that it's intended. You know, it, it occurred to me literally a minute ago that you essentially are the 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 next Eleanor Taylor Bland in the sense that very talented writer, but utterly committed to promoting the work of people of color, you know, in the business. And you guys could be twins, essentially, because this was a woman that just gave her all, 110% to see that writers of color got their due. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, she gets some kind of credit, because uh, we wouldn't be here on, on this call, probably, if it wasn't for Eleanor Taylor Bryant. That's, that's what's weird. Um, I know where I might be jumping ahead, but uh, when I first met Walter um, and we were talking about crime writers of color and starting it, he said the same, pretty much the same thing that Gar said, which is that Eleanor was the glue that held everyone together. Um, and when she passed away, unfortunately, it kind of, it wasn't as, it wasn't the same basically, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so I've never met her. I've read her, I enjoy her work. Um, so, but she sounds like an amazing person. I'm so happy that Sisters in Crime has the Eleanor Taylor Bland uh, grant that they do for an emerging writer of color every year. So. Absolutely. And of course, we, you know, we, we're saying Walter every once in a while, Walter Mosley just got to say the name. First you know? name basis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, and the other person I would uh, I'll give a shout out to the, to the late Barbara Neely. Uh, you know, oh, the Blanche yeah. books, when I found the Blanche books, I was going like, oh my God, Oprah needs to buy these books and do them. You know, and, you know, but anyway. <laughs> so let's, um, let's talk about publishing industry and the current um, infatuation with diversity and inclusion. So I'm just gonna ask you, go through quickly and ask you this and then we'll talk about it. Do you believe the current focus on um, diversity and inclusion in crime or fiction, but in fiction in general is a trend, a fad or a paradigm shift? Tracy, I mean, Tracy, you're not on this one, Kelly. <laughs> I'll take Tracy. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, I, 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 Gar, I mean, we didn't really say this, but Gar was, I think, among like the first in 1988. Um, 
with his Aaron Gunner to kind of kick yeah. things off. And then Walter came two years after him. Um, so we have, to, we have to give Gar, even though I don't want to give Gar credit for anything, we have to give Gar credit for that. Um, <laughs> you know, you. you're welcome. It's the only compliment you'll ever get. The check, uh, and, the check is in the mail. Kelly. That, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, and, and, and during that time after Gar and Walter, we had Barbara and we had Eleanor and we had um, Valerie. We had all these amazing authors. And then like, you know, in the 2000s, they all, a lot of them were gone, you know, and they weren't publishing for a variety of reasons. I think Barbara kind of stopped on her own and Valerie was saying it was hard to get published, you know, and then it's kind of been a res res resurgence the past couple of years. You know, when I came out in 2017, there weren't a lot of black um, mystery authors being published, you know, uh, Rachel was being published and Alexia was a year before me. Um, and of course, obviously Gar and Walter and Gary, um, you know, and so now I, they're finally embracing it. And I think I said this when I went my Anthony, I was like, we have to make sure it's not a trend, you know, cause I'm not a trend. None of us are trends. My life is not a trend, you know, but I do think that um, the younger generation, you know, millennials and generation Z, they expect a diversity that even as me as a generation X or boomers don't necessarily expect, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm really hoping that uh, this means that it's not a trend and it is a paradigm shift, you know? And, and I think the key though, is that we have to sell, you know, people have to buy the books because it is a business, you know? So I really encourage everyone, if you really enjoy a book, especially by an author of color, period, especially a black author in mysteries, buy the book, tell your friends about them, ask your library to buy them, you know, to make sure that we are, we aren't a trend. So that's gonna really help the cause too, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gar, what do you think? A current trend of focusing on diversity and inclusion in publishing? fad trend or paradigm shift? Well, as uh, as Kelly points out, you know, I have a, a unique perspective on this question because I've been around forever, you know, I'm as old as dirt. So I've seen trans this, this trend, quote unquote, come and go, you know, a number of times. Yeah. And what I will say about it is that it is cyclical, obviously, you know, this up and down with the, the, the embracements, uh, so to speak, of publishers with uh, artists uh, of color um, but I think what Walter and I discovered very early on is that what happens is somebody blows up and, and let's use Walter as an example. And what that means to other publishing houses is we got to have our Walter. And so they'll find one writer that they'll promote, you know, all to hell, but they think that's it, you know, okay, we've done our duty and we, we, we signed up our one our one author of color, and uh, now we can we can let it go, right? Um, right now, trust me, there are houses looking for their Sean Cosby, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, once, and once they <laughs> once they find him or her, they'll pretty much be done, okay? Mm -hmm. Until they see, you know, and, and and God help that author if that if that author doesn't blow up like Sean did. So mm -hmm. that's essentially how I've seen it work mm -hmm. from time to time. In other words, they don't. They don't, they, they don't treat us uh, with the same level of respect uh, as they do uh, writers uh, that are white. They just don't, you know, they, they think that there's a specific market for us and that market is only so big and only so many certain types of people read them, read us and certain types of people will never touch us. And because of that, they need one or two authors of color on their list and that's as far as it goes. So that's a very long-winded uh, way of answering the question, Cheryl, that in my opinion, uh, nothing, it's definitely not a paradigm shift. Uh, we haven't seen that yet. I, I, w I wait for that day for sure, because that'll mean that the door is open for everybody. Mm -hmm. you know, and and the, the day may come that a publisher has 15 to 20 authors of color on their list because those people deserve a slot. Thank you, Gary. It's a thoughtful response and I appreciate your candor on that. Um, Sean, what's your what's your take? I think it is a trend that is building toward a paradigm shift. And what I mean is, to Gar's point, you know, when I was growing up, the only writers of color that I knew that were being printed, uh, published, I should say, were Gar and Walter and, and Barbara. And like mm -hmm. Kelly said, it, it, it sort of became a, a it, I won't say it evaporated, but it kind of it, it, it lessened over the years. There was this niche market uh, for a long time of street lit. So you had guys like Omar Tyree, Kwame, uh, that were selling 
uh, but they were they were perceived as only being able to sell a certain number of, of books. You know, you would see them in a Target or a Walmart, and publishers that were publishing them didn't really get behind them. You know, you never saw them on the the the, the day show or the best of list. But people read those books. There's a lady out of Richmond, uh, Virginia, where I'm from, named Nikki Turner, who hustled her way into a publishing contract because she self-published and sold books out of the back of her car up and down, uh, you know, I-64 and I-95. And so um, I think publishing, as, to Kelly's point, the millennials, the generation behind or, or, or behind us now, they expect diverse, they expect a multitude of voices. And I think there's a, uh, a shift coming, but it's glacial. It's, it's a plate tectonic shift because the, the publishing houses are moving very, very slow on that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a reason that, you know, a book like uh, Where the Crawdads Sings, which is a sort of modern retelling of the, the classic white savior Southern Gothic, it was the number one book of 2019. And then books like, uh, you know, The Vanishing Half or, uh, or, or, or books like, uh, you know, uh, Hollywood Homicide are perceived as being, oh, that's nice but publishing houses don't seem to want to get behind it. And so when those books succeed, as Tagar said, it, it looks like, oh, well, let's get our magical Negro in here and we'll have our one magical Negro writer and that'll fill our quota. And so, you know, the true paradigm shift will be the day when we don't have to ask this question. So, right. Yeah. That's so when true. it's just normal part of everyday publishing. Right, right. It's so, it's, it's kind of, like, so it's interesting. So obviously this past summer, Black Lives Matter was such a huge, a huge thing. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was, so of course, a lot of people were embracing, I gotta read, I gotta read Black people now. I gotta read it. Usually it's just February. Now it's like, I gotta read it now because unfortunately someone died. <laughs> no, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that, that someone shouldn't have to die for you to want to read people of color to read Black people, you know? And so a lot of publishers, I will say, I was seeing so many deals from people, like six figure deals that they were getting for debut Black authors, for mystery authors and things like that. But the thing I'm curious about is these books aren't coming out till 2022 probably, you mm -hmm. know, and it's mm -hmm. gonna it's gonna be a different time then. So I'm curious if they're gonna still be as passionate about it because I call it I call it white writer money and like people all my like black women mystery writers know I just, I always say it's white writer I wanted like white writer money that's so mm -hmm. what for my next deal you know and so that we're, we're getting white writer money now but the question is will we get white writer promotion and marketing in 2022 mm -hmm. so that's going to be the curious thing I'm going to see what's going to happen and hopefully we do mm -hmm. so let me, let me ask this question see who wants to take it what is there one or two things the publishing houses the publishing industry might do that would make a difference now that would solidify the popularity of some of the books we're seeing, Sean's and Rachel's and Tracy's and others to, that, that they could do to, to prove that they're in this for the long time, that they got some skin in the game around diversity and inclusion. Um, I think that they should be able to give us room to breathe. I don't, yeah. the thing about being a black writer is that you, you only get one strike, you know, yeah. you could be a white writer and your next three books, you know, can sell in the middle range or middling or not have really great sales. And you will still get another contract with writers of color, with female, with women writers, writers of color or what have you. You don't get that one, that two strike. It's one strike. And then it's like, oh, we don't have any, we don't see you as a viable it's, uh, oh, we tried. So we tried. We tried. They don't need you. Have... Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so we need to have that room to breathe, not room to fail, but room to ride mm -hmm. the marketing wave, you know, and, and, and have second and third chances the way everybody else does, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's the thing that will show that publishing really is behind not just diversity, but multiculturalism and behind writers who are not straight white men. Right. I, I, I also think that and, and, you know, you guys may disagree with me, but I also think it's kind of problematic to create these specialty imprints, you know, in a house for, you know, authors of color or books of color, because I think that's, a, in a way, that's a way of, of ghettoizing, you know, the authors that are on their on their uh, slate. Um, you know, if, if my book or Sean's book or Kelly's book, if it's good enough to you know, to be published by a given house, you know, don't give us, you know, this sideline imprint to publish under, you know? 
Does yeah. that make sense or am I overreacting? What do you think? No, I agree. No, no, I, I think that to a certain extent, you should be a part of the main line of the publishing house. I am very, and I know it, I know this, because I'm just an ashy knuckle boy from the Virginia Hills. I am very lucky to be in the main, like flat iron catalog, yeah. you know? And I think people would look at the book differently if there was a, you know, moonshine press that published black Southern writers. <laughs> You know, or <laughs> so I think to guard point, I, do, I think there is validity in that. Well, the point that you're making is essentially in mind, and that is that you are exactly where your book belongs. You know, you you are a mainstream crime novelist. People might want to create some subcategory for you and for me and for Kelly. But the fact of the matter is you're a crime novelist. OK, and you belong in, in the main uh, main house in, in the big house, so to speak as opposed to out in the shack somewhere on the field, you know? That's, um, that's like when bookstores will have just like, they'll have the black section of yeah. of the books. They put they don't put the book, the black books in both sections. They'll put it just in the black section. Sure. That means that people have to go and find the black section to read right. black books and not everyone does that. So. That's right. I mean, the good thing about this past year because of Black Lives Matter, people were seeking out black material movies and books and those, that kind of thing. So I think we got a little more play. People have time to do it. They're stuck at home with COVID. They're thinking about how to be an anti-racist. So I think they were reading our stuff, you know? But I, um, I uh, right after like that week, I was like, let me check my sales. And they were not as big as I thought they were gonna be based on all the people claiming they were gonna read my book. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna have some stuff. <laughs> yeah. but, but it seems to me there's a kind of a parallel issue. It's it's the publishers not paying attention to what's going on in the world. I mean, we, we live in a diverse world. People want to see themselves. They want to read about themselves. Our stories have value and the interest to the broader world. And it's a, it, on the other end, we've got a set of readers who might be afraid to try the where, who might be afraid. They only go into Walmart, so they're never going to go into JCPenney's. They're never going to go into another store. How do we, how do we get to those those people, how do we convince readers that they need to at least tr try our try our work? I, it's so funny. Alexia Gordon said this once, and it's so true. She's like, if you how could you, they always say, oh, I can't connect. I can't connect with a person of color. But it's like you can connect with an alien, you can connect <laughs> with like a vampire. You know, people that things that don't exist. So how can you connect right. with those? Like right. you're watching Harry Potter, you can connect with those <laughs> witches and the vampires and all. You know, like whatever that. Twilight, but you can't connect with people like actual real people. That's that, I think that's that mindset. And that's America, the American mindset too. Unfortunately, um, that's so interesting because we're, we're expected to connect with a white protagonist, regardless. Yes. Absolutely. No matter what it is, nobody ever. We never can say, "Well, I can't really connect with Chad in Iowa. I don't understand <laughs> his cultural milieu." And you know, and, and you know, it's, so we're we're just expected to take that as the default. And I think to make people, I think people have to be willing to open their minds to it. I mean, I've gotten a lot of, uh, of, of emails from people who read Black Tie Wasteland and they think they're paying me a compliment when they say, I didn't even think he was black. Well, you missed the whole damn point of the book. What the hell? And so, anyway, that's a personal issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But uh, I, I want to come back to that. I think it's a big issue, but let me ask you a couple of individual questions. Let me start with you, Sean. Um, I've heard you talk about noir being more about the lo uh, more about the character than the location. You're writing about rural South. You're making it work. Your character is fabulous. Um, your, 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 your writing is fabulous. Talk to me a little bit more about what your goal is in writing about the rural South. Well, well, first of all, thank you for that compliment. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll be sending you a PayPal payment before the end of the night. Um, but for me, but for me, when I write about the, I think there's this idea among a lot of people, not just readers, but I think the general society at, at large, that the rural South is the sole provenance of, you know, white neo-Confederate apologists. You know, when we talk about the South, the first thing that people talk about or they think about is a, a quote unquote redneck or a quote unquote uh, a hillbilly or what have you. And, you know, my family goes back six generations in the South. Every scrap of land that somebody walks across waving a Confederate flag, 
people that look like me have bled and worked and died on it. And I'll be damned if I will let that be the sole provenance of people who don't respect me as a person. And so I want to, I think there's this idea that people have about blacks in the South that either we don't exist, that we're just window dressing, or that we're somehow these submissive, subservient, you know, uh, brave new world, Soma drinking uh, uh, folks that just, you know, take whatever's handed to us because we're in the South. And so I, I yearn and I want to write about the full breadth and width of those characters. And I use crime and, and crime fiction because it's to me the, the universal language that you can talk about. Everybody hurts. Everybody knows pain. Everybody knows desperation. You know, when people talk about crime fiction as a genre, yeah, it's a genre, but it also can be literature. I mean, you know, Dostoevsky is crime and punishment is great literature and it's about a crime. It's about a murder. And so for me, I want to explore and introduce people and, and educate people about the black rural experience at the same time, talking about class, talking about toxic masculinity, talking about the pain of poverty. And so those are the things that I aim to do. You know, I always, I've said this before, but you know, a, a dark alley in the city is scary, but to me, there's no more terrifying place on earth than a country road with no lights and you see headlights coming up, up, up behind you. So that's, that's sort of my ethos when I try to write. I'm with you on that. My that deliverance by that that guitar thing starts happening to me when I'm in dark places, country roads. <laughs> 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 I don't like it, um, Kelly. We kind of asked your individual question already that I that I told you about earlier. But so I want to ask you this: What I love about your writing is, in, you know, Dana Anderson is she is irreverent. She's funny. She's quick witted. She's observant. Um, she's, you know, she's a scaredy cat, but she's fearless in her own way too. Talk to me about how you use humor really to um, attract audiences and to get them with you. And, you know, th there are a lot of white readers who love your stuff. Are there? Uh, <laughs> good to know. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think, I, I, I think black people in general, we use humor, you know, it's better to laugh than to cry. You know, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I even with this, the whole the past couple of weeks and everything that's been going on, you know, um, there's still people making memes and jokes and things like that to help, you know, and it kind of softens the situation, mm -hmm. you know. And so for me, I wanted to write a beach read because I don't think I think with black people, we're expected to um, write issue books where it's about so hard to be black. It's just so hard, you know, <laughs> and um, and that's those books are great. But I feel like white people can write, you know, funny books and issue books and good books and bad books. And we don't get that opportunity, you know? So I really did want to do a book that was a beach read that had humor in it. Mm -hmm. um, that was, that was the goal, you know, and to kind of, and also I am doing Hollywood, which is when I worked in it, you know, and kind of having a very irreverent look at that. And again, it's better to laugh than to cry with that. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm looking at our time. I'm a, I don't know how much time we'll have for audience Q and A because I have some more questions for you guys. But Ligard, talk to me about your ability to write across series and across genre. It's obviously something that you enjoy. Um, but are you just testing your metal when you do that, or you just don't want to be boxed into any one thing? Oh, no, you an you answered the question yourself. So, <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, it's both of those things. It's like you, mm -hmm. as an author, you don't want to be boxed in. You know, you don't want to. You know, you don't want to be known for this one thing that you do really, really well mm -hmm. and nothing, you can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, as an author, you kind of want to like stretch and see, you know, what you can do, what you can't, uh, and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, and I, I can't speak for the rest of the people on the panel, but, you know, I, I write the book I want to read and mm -hmm. I like to read a lot of different things. And so when I read a book that's like really, really funny, I think to myself, you know, I think I would like to. To do that, I think that's that's where the Joe and Daddy Laudermilk books uh -huh. came from. Was my need to to lighten up a little bit and write something yeah. just for fun, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. But versatility is 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 a really uh, big thing. And and Kelly, you gave Rachel her props for that. I think that it's a uh, it it it's a valuable asset to have if you can prove to uh, the readers out there that you can do more than one thing. Great answer. So I want to ask this question about our, our kind of current situation. You know, we're, we talked about it a little bit, but we're in the era of you know, COVID where, you know, right now in Washington, D.C., the whole city is tense 
and nervous because of what we saw last week. Um, white supremacy, just front and center. Um, insurrection is front and center. You've written about it, uh, Gar. In your first book, you talked about white supremacy. So it's been around a long, a long time. Mm -hmm. So here's the question. Um, given our times, the times we're in, the issues we have, what would your protagonist do? Sean, what would Bug Montage be doing at, at the Capitol if he was at the Capitol? Yeah. <laughs> right now, he, if he was there on the six, he would probably keep his ass inside. But uh, <laughs> but he would probably be, uh, you know, I thought about this because I thought about writing a short story. Uh, hmm. He would be thinking a way to, to leverage this into a heist. Um, using, <laughs> he, you know, using the situation to his advantage. So, you know, and maybe he drive for a heist crew that's, you know, got a whole uh, truckload of masks or PPE or something like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that answer. That's good. <laughs> um, what, what would Aaron Gunner do, Gar? I think uh, very much like me, he'd just be, you know, uh, knee deep in sadness. Mm. You know, heartbroken. Uh, you know, and he's not, he's never on the front lines of activism. You know, that's not, just not who that guy is. But I think that, um, you know, I think there's a certain amount of resentment that would boil up in him. Uh, I think we're all angry, to be honest with you. You know, we, yeah. we, we play it off and we talk about, you know, the things that are funny about it, but it's not really very funny. And I think Aaron would um, be bent out of shape, frankly. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't know that he'd do anything to get himself put in jail, but I wouldn't rule it out. Let's, mm -hmm. let's... <laughs> and Kelly, what would uh, Dana Anderson do? No, I think I think black women in general, we tend to have a tendency when it's go time, we are focused and we handle our business. Yes. Um, and then once business is handled, that's when we are we break, we allow ourselves to break down and and have tears. You know, so I think right now she'd be doing what she needs to do to take care of things, you know, and I thought about that, like, because I cried like four times today mm -hmm. um, over just different things with the Biden inauguration. Yeah. And yeah. I realized it's because I felt I, ha I have never like when Trump won, I didn't cry. You know, I haven't cried for four years. And I was like, <laughs> OK, what's going on right now is now that we're free and clear of the situation. Mm -hmm. Now I can be vulnerable because it's take, you know, it's I've been strong. And I think for black women, that's what we do. We're strong. We're super strong because we have to be. Mm -hmm. And then once everything's taken care of, Every everyone is taken care of too, because we take care of everybody. Um, mm -hmm. That's when we're by ourselves and we're vulnerable, so. Mm -hmm. that's, wow, that's great. And here's what I want to take liberty as an author to talk about what Charlie Mack would do. Uh, you know, I, Charlie's big on tolerance. Um, she comes from parents, who, one's a high school principal, the other's a, an attorney. So I think she would be thinking about how, what makes these people tick? What are, what, why would these people, feel this surge of unbridled and unreasonable um, anger that they would do the kind of crazy thing they're doing and try to, I don't know if she would be trying to reach a, kind of a reach across the aisle, but I think her initial response would be anger. I doubt if she'd cry, <laughs> uh, but I think after that, she'd be going like, Let's, I wanna talk to one of the guys. Maybe I can change their mind. Um, maybe I can understand how the hell we got here because we can't move forward in this country with the kind of division that we have right now. That's that's what I think Charlie would be doing. So let me uh, switch us back to the viability of black crime writing. Um, it seems to me that, especially last year, um, there was a lot of um, Hollywood interest in black culture too. You know, we love Lovecraft County was on, Pretty Little Lies, and, you know, it's just a time, Ava DuVernay's doing her thing, Shonda's doing her thing. Um, do you think that kind of focus from Hollywood, from television, helps Black crime writers, helps the, the overall literature around uh, Black writing? Do you think that makes a difference when that when Black television shows and Black Hollywood and Black Panther and the box office is doing well for those kind of shows, it helps sell more books written by Black authors? Well, I'll take I'll take that first. And I mean, okay. the, short, the short answer is it, it can't hurt. It absolutely okay. can't hurt. You know, and, and again, like like the story I told before, 
you know, one of the ways I discovered Chester Himes was by seeing that film. So, um, and there are a lot of people that are writing for television specifically that are also uh, writing, you know, uh, for long form fiction. And, you know, I'm sure they'll find some readers strictly from their television work. So it, mm -hmm. it, it can't possibly hurt, Cheryl. I mean, it, that's one of the beauties of, of where we are, where television is concerned is that, you know, with all the new channels that we have, uh, the, all the streaming services that are creating original content, mm -hmm. there are more people of color on television now than I ever saw the, yeah, first, in the first 20 years of my life. So, I mean, that is not a bad thing and it, and it can't, can't help but create a new generation of readers of, uh, of fiction for mm -hmm. authors of color. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sean, do you have any, do you have a take on this? No. I think like to Gar's, I think I agree with Gar, it can't hurt. I think, you know, the more you show black faces in all types of situations, not just, you know, like Kelly said, not just the downtrodden, holding up the uh, bloodstained banner of suffering that you see, right. you know, a film like Queen and Slim, you see a film like Black Panther, you see a right. Netflix series like Lupin, Lupin that's on, you know, when you see the multiplicity of black faces and it can only help your writing, it can only help your, your, your uh, fiction. I think, you know, uh, you know, like, I think movie, studios, streaming network services are, like Gar said, are hungry for content. Mm -hmm. And just by the sheer fact that they need a lot of content to fill their coffers, they have to go outside their stereotypical traditional uh, uh, sources of, of inspiration. So you're gonna see, you know, really, I think strong uh, uh, content featuring black people, featuring LGBTQ people, featuring you know, people of, you know, color of all shades and, and hues. And so yeah. I think it can only help. I mean, if somebody goes to see Queen and Slim yeah. and they just, uh, or they go to see, or they watch Widows and then they want to pick up an Aaron Gunner book or, or a Hollywood Homicide book, that can only help. Right, right. Got two more questions for you and I'm, it's 9.53, so I'm going to ask them fast. Um, what's the best part of being a black crime fiction writer, Kelly Garrett? Oh my. Um, I think being able to tell our stories, to be able to, you know, like I have so many Black women in my life, like my mom, my mother, my grandmother, to my niece who's six, you know, and being able to put that on paper and representation matters, you know, and I want to make sure that my niece and that generation has, does, isn't like me where I could, I, like Gar, where I remember being, being like in her age and not seeing Black people, you know, on TV. Yeah. or only seeing them in essence in magazines, you know? And so just kind of being able to hopefully kind of rep have representation that will, you know, impact other, for, for further generations, I guess. So. Thank you. Gar, you take that, that question. What's the best part of being a black crime fiction writer? Well, you get to meet Kelly. I mean- that's... I was gonna say me. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you get on a first name basis with Sean. You know, everybody else has to call him S.A. I get to call him Sean, so that's, that's good. Um, but, but no, on a serious note, it's just, um, you know, I get, I get to tell my story. You know, that's, that's essentially every time I start out, I'm telling my story one form or another. And, uh, you know, hopefully I find an audience for it and people, you know, appreciate it. But uh, being a black crime writer is I'm writing the book I want to read, you know, and Sean ain't writing it. Kelly ain't writing it. So I, I have to write it. <laughs> right, right. Enjoy it. What about you, Sean, S.A.? <laughs> I think just to echo what everybody else said, is the ability to tell the stories that matter to me. Um, I think also the camaraderie. Uh, when Kelly reached out to me to be a member of Crime Writers of Color, you know, I, I, I finally felt like I had somebody to have my back, the whole group. Because I've done a lot of live readings back in the before times where I was the only black person in the whole bar at a Noir the Bar, where I was the only black person doing a live reading and it feels really lonely. And so to read, to reach out and, and have a, a, a network of, of writers who understand what it's like to get that email where somebody says, oh, this is really good. We just don't know what to do with it. You know, there's, there's a certain shorthand that you, you develop when you have friends and, and, and colleagues who understand what that means. That's excellent. 
I want to, uh, before we take a couple questions from the audience, uh, ask you what's coming up next for you, Sean. Let's let's go back right back to you. Oh shoot! Um, I got a book coming out in July called Razorblade Tears. Real quick, the elevator pitch is by two fathers, one yeah. black, one white, both ex cons who seek revenge for their murdered gay sons, and also while seeking revenge, they try to find redemption for their uh, homophobia and prejudice they had while they were raising their boys. Nice. Kelly, what's going, coming up? Okay, I have, I, have, I have my elevator pitch, but I have to read it because I don't know what okay. like Sean does. Okay, um, so right now I wanted to kind of uh, go into domestic suspense, which I don't think is a, has enough people of color in it. Um, and so my work in progress is like a very Megan Miranda, Lori Raider day. Um, it's own voices, so it's a black woman. It's based in New York. Um, and she's looking into the overdose death of her one-time reality star who's found within blocks of where she lives. And that reality star is actually her younger sister who she hasn't talked to in two years. So when's that coming out? It's uh, it's the work in progress. Okay. Uh, what for you? You just um put out a book last month. Interesting. Yeah. Tell us about that one. Yeah, that book is called In Things Unseen, and it's uh, essentially my take on, uh, I, I don't, I hesitate to call it Christian fiction because that, that's too uh, specific, but it's a, it's a book that deals with faith. It's about a real, uh, real-time miracle, an, an actual miracle, God-given miracle, uh, and how only four people in the world know it, it's occurred. And so that's, uh, it's, that's what that book is about, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of it, frankly. Yeah, yeah. When, uh, when the world is open again, uh, do you have uh, appearances coming up, uh, uh, up book uh, appearances or virtual? You have something coming up next Friday, Kelly. That sounds really interesting. Oh, yes. I'm doing a panel with Nano and Sisters in Crime. And so it took six years for Hollywood Homicide to go from an idea to being published. Mm -hmm. um, and including being on sub for a year and being rejected by it everybody before Midnight Inc. finally um, took a chance on me. So we're, we'll be talking about that and kind of, of my journey and my agent, uh, Michelle Richter from Fuse will be there and my uh, editor at Mid who was at Mid uh, Midnight Inc. who's with Crooked Lane, Terry Bischoff will be there. So we'll all be discussing kind of using my book to discuss publishing. So That's excellent. That's and it's, it's Friday. Um, if you go to my like Twitter account, Kelly Cal, K-E-L-Y-E-K-E-L-L, -L, you can, I always like tweet about it so you can find it, information there. So. Excellent. I'll be there. Um, there's a question from uh, Allison Gates. Are there any recommendations for graphic books, crime fiction reads by black authors? A like graphic novel? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm sure there are. I feel like Gary writes those, right? Gary Phillips. Yeah, Gary Phillips. Yeah, Gary writes, has written a couple. Yeah. Right. Uh, ch check out Gary Phillips, um, Allison. Um, Sean, who do you want to play Bugs? Bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked. I've been asked this question a lot. I have two people that I would love to see. I can see both of them doing a really good job. Uh, John David Washington or Sterling K. Brown. Mm. Yeah, both of those would be good. Uh, Gar, you and Kelly both have a common experience in that you have written for television series uh, before. Did that uh, experience make you uh, a better crime writer? Or, or not? Uh, Kelly, why don't you take that first? Um, I, I, I think so. I think um, it helped me with pacing. I think it helped me with plot twist. Uh, I think it helped me with um, making sure every chapter ends on a kind of a climactic note to make people want to keep reading. Mm -hmm. um, and also developing characters and especially because I, I, I write a series as my first books yeah. were, you know, and kind of having those characters that you can kind of be with for more than one book, so. Yeah, and what about you, Gar? I think that it, it teaches, t television writing teaches you how to get in and get out, you know? Yeah. Uh, be sparse, you know, no, no word wasted, et cetera, et cetera, so. And that's that's helped my fiction immensely, I think, so, yes. Same. Excellent. Um, it's 10 o'clock. I think we're gonna um, not take questions unless you guys wanna go overtime. It's, I mean, it's 10 o'clock here in the East. I, I mean, I don't mind if there's other, if there's a few okay. questions. No, I'm, no, a, I'm still awake. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. let me see. Somebody <laughs> point me to the questions. Let's see, Anissa, I need some help from you. I've there's seen one, some there's come one, by. There's one question from YouTube, which is, um, how has your method of research changed since the pandemic or has it? Hmm. 
Who wants to start with that one? <laughs> I hate doing research. <laughs> I hate doing research. That's why I make up towns. <laughs> I, I hate. I, I'm lazy. As, I'm lazy as hell. I'm the laziest writer in the world. I admire writers like Kelly, who has like this long, big whiteboard and complex outlines, and there's an algorithm, and somebody here <laughs> at one. I, I, don't, I don't do any of that. <laughs> I, and I should. I really should because I would save myself so much trouble on the back end when I got to do edits. But it, I'm just. I'm lazy. They used to say that about me in school too. You know. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, that's kind of. Pandemic. Only thing. It, no, go ahead. The only thing that changed was I, I, I used to do a lot of like stuff at the library just because I was old school. So now I'm just doing stuff on Google. Oh, okay. okay. What about for your action scenes and your, your car chase scenes? Or some of those moves I was going, I was trying to put, I'm going like, can you do that? that that's a 180 degree turn. How do, how do you come up with that? You don't research that? I researched it because I grew up around cars. My, uh, my one of my my close cousins who's no longer with us, he was a car, our car mechanic, but he also uh, did like legal and illegal drag racing, and so uh, I knew a little bit about that just in just from my own life. But uh, I also I'm a huge car nut, so I've kind of had a lifetime of researching that. And I used to have a uh, I used to have a '71 Chevelle that my mom made me get rid of. I built it when I was in high school. And I got three speeding tickets in the same day. Made me sell it. So. <laughs> well, you needed to three. Dang, <laughs> you probably can't even drive. Your license is probably suspended. <laughs> I couldn't drive for a year. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, well, I couldn't legally drive. Yeah, you couldn't legally <laughs> drive. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what about you during COVID? How's your research pattern change? You do I mean, I, I, yeah, I still do a lot of research online. Basically, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I um, live in New Jersey, and I uh, would commute to the city. So I was, I was, I was really good at eavesdropping on people so I, I can't do that anymore yeah, yeah. um but yeah it's, it's, it's still online it's not it's not yeah. different so. Well, so has hollywood changed a lot since you've been away from it do you have to look up things about are you, that was the hard thing about the second book so the first book i was actually still in la and it was really easy to like name okay. drops it's like you know places and um right you know, like streets. And then second book, I had to look a lot of stuff up on Google Maps. I had to ask friends because places were closed that I loved, you know, so it was definitely hard. So the new series is actually set in New York. So I can, uh, I don't have to worry about uh, trying to figure out things. So. Hey, Gar, what's your, your research pro process? Uh, I'm like, Sean, I just lie. <laughs> 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 No, really, you know, one of the one of the tricks of the trade is is to lie real, you know, in a way that's believable, you know. So right. I do as much research as necessary, generally online, um, you know. But then, you know, if I can find a way to fake something so that it doesn't, you know, read that way, I'm that's what I'm going to do for sure. You, you, know? you have to have done some research on firearms. You're very specific when you're describing weapons. Yeah, but you know, the the reality is. You could probably get away with a lot less than I use, but um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I do as much as, as I think I need to, to sound, you know, like I know what I'm writing about. Mm -hmm. And using Sean as an example, you know, he obviously knows cars, you know, um, I, I wouldn't have picked a, a duster uh, for a bus car myself, but, uh, you know. <laughs> it's working out well for him, though. His, his mistake worked out. Well, you know, the duster, the duster, the duster had like uh, uh, three options when it was first mass produced, and my dad had one, and he got the uh, the uh, uh, four barrel six slant six option. So those yeah. cars get up. They that, so that's why that that's where that came from. Right. Plus, everybody else uses Chevelles and Impalas and and stuff. So I was like, I'm gonna throw a duster in there. But I'm like, Gar, I just fake it. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing your new work, faked or not. Um, Gar, I hope you have great success with your, really a departure for you, your, your new book, but it's so well written and really thoughtful. And you think about it days after you finish reading it. You well, know? thank you, Cheryl. And Kelly, really looking forward for your next, you're going to do another series in the, in the day series too, in addition to this one? Um, I, I, 
Uh, I'm, my asking pub- your, I'm asking for your publisher. <laughs> uh, my publisher closed in 2018, so um, they have to be res- resurrected. So uh, and they have to pay me. So I don't know. Yeah, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has uh, been a lovely conversation. I thank you for allowing. No, me- you were an amazing, you. amazing moderator. So thank, thank you so, you so much, much for doing it. Thank you so much. You guys, uh, you know, you best-selling, award-winning authors. I'm just hoping all this, all of it, rubs off on me through the Zoom lens. Um, Good night to everybody. Thanks for all the people who came and asked questions. And I hope you will buy the books of our panelists and buy the books of the people we mentioned. We really have a wealth of talent in the crime writing community, not only our black crime writers, but our writers of color. And and just to to send us off, Kelly, will you uh, give us two minutes on the crime writers of color group? Sure. Um, Crime Writers of Color was started by myself, Walter Mosley, and Gigi Pondian, um, I think two years ago. And we all kind of came together because we were saying earlier we wanted a a safe space for people, writers of color, crime writers of color to, you know, get together and network and to talk about the unique experiences that come with being us because we aren't always appreciated by publishing like we should be, you know? And so it started off, I think we all invited people we knew, like, you know, Walter was like, I'll invite Gar and Gary and I invited Sean and I invited Tracy and I invited all my friends, Rachel and you and um, Gigi invited her people she knew, you know? And so now we have over 200 and 50 members, I think, and they're from all, all, all areas of their career, but people like Walter and Gar and Sean and you, and people who are writing their first crime novel or looking for an agent, you know, and we're, it's so great because it's such a positive group. You know, we celebrate every success. We have a good news thread that happens every month. And it's literally, I think, probably hundreds of comments because people share their news and people all chime in about how great it is, you know, and, and I'm just such so happy with the group. I think it's exceeded all of our expectations when it comes to me, Walter and Gigi and just of what's happening with it, you know, and hopefully we can kind of, you know, take it to further steps and, you know, have conferences and, you know, and things for people too. So so I'm excited for it. Yeah, thank you for your leadership and oh, putting thank it together you. and keeping it together. Sean, good luck. Gar, <laughs> you good success. Kelly, thank you so much. Anissa, I'm throwing it back to you at the San Francisco All Public right. Library. Thank, thank you so much, um, authors. Thank that you. was thank so you. fun. We really appreciate that. Our community, lots of love in the river of chat. And yes, buy books and request books. We will buy any book you want from our library. And that link right there that I just put in again, we tried to keep up with you with all of those um, <laughs> authors. So, but I think we did pretty well between Lisa and I. So you can find all those there. You can find their books on those links and I'll send you a reminder tomorrow too. So don't worry. And thank you, Kelly, Cheryl, Gar. Essay. Thank you. Thank you and Lisa for, for doing this and for having us, you know. Thank you. We really appreciate that. So much. That was such a so much fun. So fun. All right, friends. Let's have a good night. Everybody stay safe. We miss you. We love you. Good night. Can we